So the funding um, is provided by the agencies you see here. And as I mentioned, there was a lot of in-kind services provided by people who found data that we needed or answered questions or met and so on. So appreciations, our appreciation to all of them. So um, a guiding philosophy is that use and conservation of land are equal values. So how did I get on this path? Uh, as Richard mentioned, I was the executive director of the Real Estate Foundation, I have to admit, for 22 years. Uh, back in 1993, uh, I was looking, I was in my third year, 92, I was in my third year of that position. And I was looking at the Real Estate Act, which says in very narrowly that the foundation would support nonprofit endeavor related to land use and real estate, very traditional ideas. Um, and land is defined as the ground and whatever improvements are on the ground. And it struck me, well, why aren't we talking about the land and whatever natural assets are on the land? Um, so I spent a year convincing the governors that we should adopt a philosophy at the foundation, which was that um, use and conservation of land are equal values. And from that point on, the foundation began to fund work in the stewardship and conservation sector. At that time, too, I think it's important to mention that green infrastructure ideas and practices were just getting underway. And we've seen those involve over the last 20 plus years, almost 30 years now. Um, so a question I've been asking is, if we know how to do a much better job of protecting ecological features, in our communities and our landscapes, uh, why aren't we doing a better job? Why are we still seeing streams uh, being degraded? Uh, why do we still see practices that are embedded in land use policy and regulation that are 50 years old at times? Uh, how do we change that? I think the evolution of green infrastructure ideas is what we're uh, witnessing now with increased stewardship activity, with the launch of the Municipal Natural Capital Initiative Program, and um, Manu Machado was introduced earlier, uh, pinhole him for questions you might have about that program. And also with the Ecological Accounting Protocol uh, demonstration, we're, we're trying to uh, move in the direction that you would expect green value activity to go. So, and I, I guess I should just emphasize, I mean, this is the goal we're trying to get to, that we would have our settlements in balance with ecology so we're not degrading what we depend on. Okay, the purpose of the ecological accounting program. Uh, in so many words, create an account of the worth that the ecological services of a creek shed uh, produce or provide, and the extent to which stakeholders recognize the services and make use of them. Uh, the objectives of the ecological accounting program are to prepare a creek shed profile carry out an analysis of creek shed hydrology using the water balance methodology, identify measures that will reduce or avoid loss and improve the quality and amount of ecological services that may be drawn from the hydrology of the watershed or creek shed, review stakeholder views about risks and opportunities concerning the creek shed ecological systems, describe and to the extent possible quantify the worth expenditures, donated labor, expertise, leverage funding, and so on, of measures, measures are works and strategies undertaken by stakeholders to protect and enhance ecological systems. Finally, produce some kind of a proxy statement about the useful, that would be useful to uh, municipal departments especially that are undertaking budgeting that may involve natural assets and also for their asset management sustainability asset management um, strategies. Uh, how do stakeholders or how can stakeholders use uh, the ecological accounting uh, profile findings? Uh, there's quite a list here, but I'll go through them quickly. Uh, it 
produces a creek shed profile. Uh, so that's the historical condition of the watershed. Uh, it produces the water balance analysis of the watershed or creek shed hydrology. It assesses the condition of the ecological services dependent on that hydrology. It suggests a strategy to improve ecological services and support plans for specific projects, which will address uh, statutory mission driven and social cultural mandates. Uh, it suggests adoption of a process whereby stakeholders, including local governments, in integrate policy and projects and initiatives in the, in the watershed. Um, and this is very important where watersheds or creek sheds typically lie in more than one jurisdiction. Uh, if one party is doing something and the other isn't, there will be uh, conflicts. Um, a management and maintenance plan be undertaken by the stakeholders. And here management means um, the enhancement of the creek shed and maintenance means preventing degradation. A process to calculate the worth of potential projects and works. Um, so is it worth doing? And an accounting of financial expenditures for projects as they are undertaken. And a creek shed management strategy which supports the local government asset management work. So in this um, research, we looked at two case studies. Uh, one is Shook uh, Busy Place Creek in the um, Cowichan Valley Regional District and uh, Cowichan Tribal Lands. It's just south of Duncan. Um, the other is, uh, we'll see it shortly, uh, Brooklyn Creek, which is in the Comox Valley, and it flows through city of Courtney, the regional district, and the Comox, uh, town of Comox. So Busy Place Creek, um, it's two point hectares in area. It's 32% uh, industrial land use, 30% residential, 28% agricultural, 10% First Nations. So what we've learned, on my glasses so I can see that. Uh, what we learned in our profile is this creek sheds like many creek sheds on Vancouver Island. 150 years ago it was forested. Now it's a multiple, um, it's under multiple uses. Uh, the hydrology has been altered by uh, forestry, roads, uh, urban, rural development, industrial uses like gravel mining, agriculture, and so on. Uh, in the case of uh, Busy Place Creek, I'll see if I can use this pointer. <clears throat> The lower part of the creek uh, is on the edge of the Cowichan estuary, so it's in a floodplain. And the upland areas here are, uh, it's not a very high elevation, it falls maybe 150 meters altogether. Uh, so this is uh, residential in this area primarily. Cowichan tribes lands in this corner and down in the bottom. So the headwaters and then where Busy Place Creek meets the Coxsila River, is in uh, Cowichan tribal lands. Um, there's agricultural uses in this area primarily, and more or less that area is agricultural. That's the industrial park, um, and there's gravel mining on this perimeter down here. The gravel mining is deep enough that it's uh, into the uh, water table. So some of the water used to come into this creek shed is now going to a different uh, uh, creek shed. So it's quite a lot of uh, alteration. When we applied the water balance model, what we found was uh, if the retention were increased in the watershed, the rainfall retention, that would enhance a number of ecological services that the stakeholders are concerned about or would like to access. So those are the, the sorts of things they're concerned about are, uh, in general, more rural development, which would affect the hydrology. Uh, flooding is an issue. Uh, lack of water in the summer for firefighting is another kind of issue. Uh, whether or not there's enough water for fish down in the, the lower part of the, the creek shed. And uh, also they're concerned about uh, 
water, the contamination of water that comes from uh, roadside ditches that goes into the stream without being uh, cleaned through another small wetland area or some other means. Uh, in our analysis, we found that if there were three areas where there were wetlands, that's number one, number two, number three. Uh, they're remnant wetlands now, but they're in agricultural areas. Uh, these two are primarily uh, ephemeral now. They exist for a little bit in the spring and then they're gone. Uh, it's only forage crops that's growing on them, so it'd be easy to convert those back to wetland areas. And if that were done, along with this one, uh, the third one, which is down in, down in here, um, if those were uh, enhanced and returned to use as primarily wetlands, the retention in the creek shed be, could be increased quite a lot. Uh, that would have a number of benefits for riparian zones, for terrestrial and aquatic uh, life. Uh, it would um, provide more nutrients going down to the floodplain. It would provide cooler water for fish, more water for fish in a longer duration of flow during the summer. So there's a number of benefits. Uh, we looked at the cost of putting in those wetlands, which are easily accessed areas, so they're uh, low cost work. The three wetlands uh, could be um, installed at the, about uh, two and a half hectares or say four and a half acres total area at a cost of around $100,000. So what's the stakeholder investment in Busy Place Creek? So stakeholders have done work on the creek. Uh, they've put in a, a refuge and uh, uh, spawning area for coho salmon and uh, trout. Uh, they've done some remediation of areas where there was uh, erosion. Uh, there's been a small bit of improvement on one private property and some other works. About $150,000 of cash has been invested over the last decade. Uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit of in-kind involvement as well. And in addition, uh, the stewardship sector, the stream keepers over 17 years, have invested about $277,000 of donated, donated time and services. Um, if we added these numbers together and then combined them with the um, $100,000 or so it would take to restore the wetlands, you'd get a, a total value of about $520,000. If you spent 1% of that a year, $5,200 to maintain it, would probably be enough to protect your sunk investment. Uh, if you wanted to improve it, you'd probably have to spend about 2% of your uh, invested value to do that. So it just gives you a rough idea of the situation in that watershed and what the stakeholders think it is worth thus far by what they've invested. And with the aspirations they have, there could be a lot more uses. For example, Parks Department wants to put a trail along an abandoned rail corridor that goes up the valley. Um, if the wetlands were put in, the creek shed was enhanced, the wetland areas or the riparian areas would be enhanced, much better environment for parks, would probably have an uplift on property values in the area because a certain amount of nature gets capitalized into real estate. Uh, those kinds of things. So there's, um, there's also the importance of flood mitigation at certain times of the year, and these measures would also help to uh, mitigate uh, the potential of flooding. Left or spent? Okay. I think I'd better move along. Uh, the second uh, project is Brooklyn Creek. Uh, it lies in three jurisdictions, as I mentioned. It's about six square kilometers in area one-thirds rural development, two-thirds urban land uses, and the total distance from the top of the catchment to the outflow is about 10 kilometers. The, uh, the condition uh, of the watershed from the profile research. So the upper watershed lies in the city of Courtney. It's almost totally developed for recreational, uh, commercial, and residential. And uh, it's a fully engineered area. The, the creek and headwaters area doesn't exist in a natural state. And there's an outflow at the boundary with the regional district, which is right there, um, 
that takes the collected water from the upper uh, watershed area uh, through the various engineered uh, systems and delivers it across the border into the regional district, uh, into the creek. Um, the middle area, which is here, is in area B of the region, regional district of uh, Comox Valley. And uh, it's an old rural subdivided area, um, could be further subdivided. It's a good example of most communities have a lot of zoning on the map that isn't built out or that's built out that could be further subdivided. So communities are battling not what might happen in the future, but having to deal with what's already been put on the map, as it were, as potential development. Um, the middle, this middle area is the best area for improving the retention in the watershed. Uh, when we ran the water balance uh, model here to analyze it, uh, there is no interflow really. It's all been uh, vastly interrupted mainly by uh, highways ditching, ditching along roads, uh, by agriculture, by large private lots that have done various things on the land and so on. So the outcome of that is a lot of flow that used to go into the ground no longer goes into the ground. Instead, it goes down the creek to town of Comox, which is down here. And for the town of Comox, that means dealing with uh, threats from erosion, sedimentation, debris pileup, uh, and uh, some damage to private property if they don't manage it. So if we look at the stakeholder views about the watershed, in the upper watershed, the ecology has been subordinated to engineering and drainage systems. Uh, there's no parks in the watershed except one small one. The city of Courtney doesn't intend to add any parks. Uh, the management of the actual drainage system is done by Crown Isle Development, uh, and they don't plan any changes. So that's, uh, that's a kind of a lost part of the watershed. Uh, the middle watershed is by nature um, a reactive regime. That is, a regional district does not have authority over land use planning. It's, that's in the hands of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, where uh, the regional district can have some authority is in development permit areas, and they have some. But changes are only driven when someone makes an application for subdivision or alteration of an existing property. Um, so that could be redevelopment or infill. Um, so to get any change in that uh, part of the watershed, the middle of the watershed, the likely thing would be some kind of a, a strategic cooperation between town of Comox and the uh, Comox Valley Regional District. The lower, lower watershed is extensively uh, developed. Um, also, um, the stakeholders have made extensive development, investment, I should say. So uh, what happened was in 2005, uh, the town was forced to deal with uh, severe erosion problems, and they built a diversion structure to take 20% of the peak flow of the creek and pipe it directly to uh, Cowichan Bay. So that was $1.98 million to put that in. Um, at that time, uh, they thought that maybe there was some management that needed to happen uh, in order to avoid further expensive remediation. So they joined with the local um, Brooklyn, Creek, Brooklyn Creek Watershed Society, uh, the Parks Department, Engineering Department, uh, and Current Environmental, which is a private firm that does a lot of uh, biology consulting for clients in the Upper Island. They joined together and they devised a long-range plan to do restoration. Now, all of their restoration applies to lands that either the town of Comox owned or they could acquire to include in their strategy. 
So here's an example of some of the work they did. Uh, this is um, along the border of a property that uh, at that time was owned by School District 71. And uh, this is one example. Here they restored uh, the stream corridor. So it was before a, a wide muddy ditch and uh, now it's a salmon uh, area, salmon spawning, salmon habitat area. Uh, they acquired two acres from the school district for a nominal amount of one dollar. Uh, probably the real financial value was about three hundred thousand dollars an acre for this kind of land. Uh, this work was carried out by a parks budget and funds raised by the Watershed Society. The town of Comox got a pretty good deal here because there was a lot of leverage of funding. Parks, uh, they put in about 50,000 a year for the last 11 years into maintenance and enha enhancement work. Um, about half of that budget comes through parks at the town of Comox and about half is raised from outside funders through the town of Comox and the Watershed Society. So um, it's a lot of value for the investment. The other part of their strategy that has worked really well is uh, the area on the right that isn't completed yet along the rail fence is a greenway segment. And there's a continuous greenway plan for the creek from uh, where it enters the town of Comox to where it goes to, into uh, the harbor. Uh, so local residents see this progress going on. They see the work being done. They see how it's done. They get to use the parks. They get to use the trails. They see it as part of their urban woodland strategy. Uh, nesting trees are protected. A lot of values. But they also accept that it's part of the town's drainage system. And it needs to be maintained as a natural part of the infrastructure which is being done. So what made this work was the long range strategy and annual work plans, uh, the kind of collaboration that was involved, a focus on a package of ecological services so that people saw the benefits for ecology and they saw the benefits for land uses or the human settlement as being compatible and not in conflict. So the amount of investment in this case, uh, 1,977,000 for the uh, diversion and uh, to date about uh, 796,000 of expenditures in kind and in cash uh, to carry out 11 years of the um, enhancement and management plan. Uh, future outlays for enhancement uh, and other features, if they spend at least 1% of the capital value that's already sunk into the watershed, uh, they would need to spend about $28,000 a year. Uh, presently, they're spending, expecting to spend about half of that, but a more real number might be 2%. So it gives you an idea that uh, if you have these services, you want to maintain them, there's a cost to doing it, you can figure out what the cost, what your range of costs should be. Uh, finally, we looked at um, the idea of valuing the stream corridor itself and the riparian zone. So here we have two properties on either side of the stream. There's a setback area, which is the width of the arrow. So imagine that going along the stream. So a certain amount of each property plus the stream corridor is in the commons. So what we did is we said, well, what if you analyze this uh, setback area and calculate what it's worth? So what we did, there's um, uh, a map, a GIS uh, map of the stream, a section of the stream in the town of Comox. You can see how the green shaded area is the setback zone and it crosses a number of lots. So we took some of these lots and we figured out um, how much area is in what we call the common zone and what, what is the value of that area. And we came up with some numbers. So the value we got in total was um, the commons area at 50% of the value. We looked at about eight properties. 
Um, so that came out at about $500,000 of value, 50% of the assessed value. So we're using BC assessment numbers. Um, the value per kilometer would be 2.7 million on this basis. And the 2.5 kilometers of stream that are in the town of Comox would be 6,763,000. Uh, um, if the town were managing all of that at 1% a year, they'd be spending $67,000 a year to manage uh, the ecological services in the creek shed, riparian zone, and creek corridor in the town of Comox. And finally, um, the worth of a creek shed is a package of ecological services made possible by the hydrology. They're not separable. You can't deal with one without affecting the other. Uh, that's a very basic thing we've heard repeated a number of times today. And um, communities that don't understand that are leaving a lot of value on the table and they're wasting a lot of taxpayers' money. So thank you very much.